Welcome to chapter 1 of this course. Chapter 1 will deal with the introduction to the basic concepts of veterinary parasitology. The chapter 1 has 8 modules. The first module will talk about the introduction to veterinary parasitology. The second module will uh, deal with the parasites and parasitism. The next module will talk about the modes of transmission of the parasites. Next is the methods of dissemination of the infective stages of the parasites. We also have the parasite specificity in relation to various factors. Tissue reactions caused by parasites to the host. Resistance of the host and the nomenclature for parasites. This presentation shall have three objectives. First, it aims to introduce veterinary parasitology to students. It also aims to describe the important types of symbiotic relationships. And it also aims to examine the clinically relevant relationships and interactions between the parasite, its host, and the environment. Let us first start with the definition of veterinary parasitology. Veterinary parasitology is defined as a study of the parasites of animals. It is also defined as the science that explores the relationship between the various animal hosts and their parasites. Simply, it is the study of the relationship between a parasite and its animal host. Comparing veterinary parasitology from medical parasitology, Veterinary parasitology is a study of the animal parasites, especially the relationships between parasites and animal host. While medical parasitology deals with parasites which infect humans, the diseases caused by them, the clinical picture, and the response against them. So in studying veterinary parasitology, our main focus is on parasites. A parasite is an organism that lives on or in a host and gets its food from or at the expense of its host. That is according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Parasite induces parasitism. When we say parasitism, that is a type of relationship between two species where one species, the parasite, benefits at the expense of the other which is the host. When a parasites cause disease in their host, they are referred to as pathogens. Now that is according to nature.com. There are three disciplines under veterinary parasitology. The first one is veterinary entomology. So this field or this discipline deals with the study of the parasitic arthropods including insects, ticks, and mites. The second discipline is veterinary protozoology. This is the study of the wide range of parasitic protozoa. Also included in this uh, field is veterinary helminthology. This is, uh, deals with the three main groups of parasitic worms, the trematodes, cystodes and the nematodes. So when we are going to study veterinary parasitology, we are not only going to focus on the host and the parasite, but more importantly, we are going also to deal with the association, interaction, or the relationship between the host and the parasite. So many organisms live together in varied intricate relationships. The association between organisms can be described as symbiosis. The term symbiosis comes from the word sim, which means together, and biosis, which means living, thus living together. Symbiosis describes any association, either temporary or permanent, between at least two living organisms of different species. Each member of this association is called a symbiont. 
So some of these relationships can be beneficial, some are indifferent, and others are detrimental to one or more of the organisms. The term symbiosis may have different uh, contexts or meaning depending on the author, but for this lecture, we are going to use symbiosis as an umbrella term for organisms that live together. So under this uh, relationship or a symbiotic relationship, you know, we have the, the, the term poresis, commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism. So one example or one type of a symbiotic relationship is poresis. So this is a relationship between two symbionts which are merely traveling together and without dependence on each other. So the symbionts under the poretic relationship are known as forons. So one will be larger than the other and the smaller foron will be mechanically carried by the larger foron. So an example of a poretic relationship is between a mite and a beetle as shown in this diagram. The mite is the, the smaller one, the smaller foron, and the other foron is the beetle. So the mites are located on the head and the body of the beetle, and the, the, the mites feed on the nematodes in the beetle's nest chamber. So their relationship is considered to be poetic because they are uh, just merely traveling you know, with each other and they do not depend on each other biochemically and biochemically and physiologically. So an example of a symbiotic relationship is mutualism. It is defined as a relationship that are mutually dependent on each other for food and shelter. So one cannot survive without the other. So an example of this is the relationship between the gut symbiota intestinal protozoa that is located in the gut of the termites. So the termites and the gut symbiota has a symbiotic relationship. The termites, also known as wood ants, eat wood to meet their nutritional demand. The wood contains 40 to 50 percent cellulose. Most of the multicellular organisms can't digest cellulose by their own. The termites also can do this by their own. So within the gut of the termites are the endosymbiont microbes or bacteria and protozoa. These organisms reside in the hindgut of the termite and secrete an enzyme called cellulase. Thus, these bacteria and protozoans help termite to fulfill its nutritional requirement and also make them immune to pathogen attack. In return, the termite provide its gut symbiont with protection and food, such as cellulose. These protozoans would die outside the termite, and termite also can survive without them. As both the, uh, as both the partners are benefited, so this is an example of symbiosis or the symbiotic relationship. So another type of the interaction between uh, organism is commensalism. So this is a relationship where one symbiont derives its benefit from the other symbiont, the host, but the host is neither benefited nor harmed. So this relationship can either be obligatory or facultative. It is obligatory when the host is required for the survival of the symbiont and facultative when the host is not required for their survival. An example of this is the Intamoeba gingivalis in the human mouth. Intamoeba gingivalis is considered to be an obligatory commensal in the mouth of human. It feeds on bacteria, food, and dead epithelial cells but never harms the healthy tissue in the mouth. Another example of commensalism is the relationship between the shark and Remora, its hitchhiker. 
The remora attaches to the underside of the shark and hitches a ride. The remora also eats the food scraps or leftovers after the shark's meal. The remora benefits from this relationship, whereas the shark is neither benefited nor harmed. Another type of association between organism is predation. When we say predation, that is, uh, it means that one member, the predator, benefits and a smaller organism, the prey, is harmed and usually eaten. So an example of this is the relationship you know, between cats and mice. So the cat will serve as the predator and the mice is the prey. Another important example in the association between organisms are the parasitoid. When we say parasitoids, these are small insects whose immature stages develop either within or attached to the outside of the other insects, referred to as the host. Parasitoids eventually kill the host they feed on, as opposed to parasites like fleas and ticks which typically feed upon host without killing them. So an example of a parasitoid is the tachinid fly eggs. So in this figure, we have here the Japanese beetle, and these white, one, white uh, spots here are the tachinid fly eggs. So these tachinid fly eggs can be classified as a parasitoid because when it will develop into its advanced stages, it will eventually kill the host you know, they feed on. So another example of a parasitoid is the interaction between a Japanese beetle grub with an external tefeya larval parasitoid uh, that is uh, here shown in the yellow arrow. So this uh, tefeya larval or tefeya larvae will later develop into this host and it will later kill this uh, host, the Japanese beetle grub. We also have here another type of parasitoid, the parasitoid pupa that emerges from a spotted cucumber beetle. So it will eventually kill its host which is the uh, spotted cucumber beetle. It developed within this um, host and it will later also kill the host. So another example of a parasitoid is the interaction between a tobacco hornworm that has been killed by cotesha larvae, which have pupated outside the host. So we also have here another example, the braconid wasp attacking the gypsy moth caterpillar. So the wasp is considered to be a parasitoid. It lays its eggs on the host, the caterpillar, and the larvae feed on its gut until they emerge after pupation as adults. So another very important interaction or association between organism is parasitism. Parasitism is defined as an intimate association between organisms of two or more kinds, especially one in which a parasite obtains benefits from a host which it usually injures. So the parasite becomes metabolically dependent on the host. The infestation with or disease caused by the parasite is known as parasitosis. So we have here an example of parasitism, the flea infested fowl. So the flea is the parasite and the fowl is the host. This is considered to be parasitism because first, we have here an intimate relationship you know, between the parasite, the flea, and the host, or the fowl. Another is the flea, which is the parasite, lives at the expense of the host. The parasite is metabolically dependent on the host meaning that it depends on the host for survival and for food, while the host is being uh, harmed or injured. 
Parasitism can occur in different degrees. For example, healthy cattle on pasture may harbor in their gastrointestinal tract parasites, but the cattle do not exhibit outward clinical signs of parasitism. So this is an example of parasitiasis. In parasitiasis, the parasite is present on or within the host and is potentially pathogenic or harmful. However, the animal does not exhibit outward clinical signs of the disease. So an important term, another important term is parasitosis. So this emaciated cow probably harbors millions of roundworms in its GIT. As a result, the cow exhibits obvious outward clinical signs. So this is referred to as parasitosis. So in parasitosis, the parasite is present on or within the host and thus produce obvious injury or harm to the host animal. The host exhibits obvious outward signs of clinical parasitism. So therefore, from this lecture, you know, we can say that a parasite can cause parasitiasis in some animals with low parasite burden or number. However, it may also cause parasitosis with a high parasite burden. We can also classify parasites depending on their location on the host. So we have those parasites that are known as ectoparasites. They live on the outside or the skin of the host. So an example of these parasites are ticks, mites, lice, and fleas. So from this diagram, we have here a cat flea, Tenocephalidis felis, on a severely flea-infested and anemic cat. So this is an example of an ectoparasite. In the parasites are parasites found within the body of its host. They can be found in the blood, tissue, or GIT. Examples of endoparasites are roundworms and tapeworms in the gut. So we have here a diagram showing an example of uh, an endoparasite, the helminth parasite roundworm, Toxas caris leonina, that is found in the gut of its host. Endoparasitism is the parasitism by an internal parasite, while ectoparasitism is the parasitism by an external parasite. An ectoparasite will produce an infestation on the host, and an endoparasite will produce an infection within that host. According to the Pediatric Infectious Disease Journal, to infest or infest conveys the idea of external attack upon something, very appropriate for ectoparasites. Infection on the other side conveys the idea of an internal parasitism. Attack may be included, but attack with penetration. You also have here uh, uh, this cat fleece, Tenocephalidis felis, live within a dog or cat hair coat. They are ectoparasites and produce ectoparasitism Similarly, these fleas produce infestation in the host hair coat. We also have here uh, another example of an endoparasite, the heartworms. So these heartworms live in a dog's heart. They are endoparasites and produce uh, the condition known as endoparasitism. Heartworms produce infection within the host heart. So another are the obligate parasites. So when we say obligate parasites, these are those that cannot complete their life cycle. They cannot survive and they cannot reproduce without spending a part of it on the host. So it is said that an obligate parasite must lead a parasitic existence. So when we say parasitic existence, uh, this is an existence wherein the organisms are directly dependent on another organisms for their survival, for their uh, reproduction, or for them to be able to complete their life cycle. It is said that obligate parasites are not capable of leading a free-living existence. 
So when we say free living existence, this is an existence wherein the parasite or the organism are not directly dependent on another organism for it to be able to survive, for it to be able to reproduce, or for it to be able to complete its life cycle. So an example of an obligate parasite are the heartworm. So heartworm is an example of a helminth parasite. Now it is a roundworm or a nematode. So it is uh, considered to be an obligate parasite because it needs uh, a host you know, in order for it to be able to complete its life cycle and for it to be able to survive and reproduce. So it is said that most of the parasites that affect domesticated and wild animals are obligatory parasites. Sometimes a parasite will wander from its usual site of infection into an organ or location in which it does not ordinarily live. When this happens, the parasite is called an erratic or aberrant parasite. An example of this are the cuterebra. Cuterebra is a fly species that is found in the skin of dogs or cats. It may accidentally wander or migrate into the skull cap. When this happens, the cuterebra becomes an erratic or aberrant parasite. In this figure, the cuterebra species, which are normally found in the skin of dogs or cats, may migrate into the cranial bulk or the skull cap. The cuterebra species can then be considered an erratic or aberrant parasite, meaning that the parasite has become lost on its migration path. We also have here uh, another figure showing the enlargement you know, of the parasite in the cranial bulb of the skull. A parasite can occur in a host in which it does not usually live. So this type of parasite are known as incidental parasite. So this, uh, this is exemplified by the canine heartworm in humans. So humans can become infected with the larval stages of the canine heartworm, the Rufilaria imidis. So humans are not the usual host for heartworm. So canine heartworm is an incidental parasite in humans. So this diagram here uh, represents a chest radiograph from a man showing the presence of nodules in this lobe of the lungs as a result of pulmonary derifiliariasis in men. Organisms that are free living or non-parasitic can become parasitic in certain hosts. These organisms are called facultative parasites. An example is the Pelodera strongyloides, a free-living soil nematode or roundworm. It usually lives in the superficial layers of the soil as a non-parasite. However, this can penetrate the skin of dogs lying in moist dirt and downer cattle, establishing a parasitic skin infection. A parasite does not necessarily have to live on or within a host. It can make frequent short visits to its host to obtain nourishment or other benefits. Such a parasite is called a periodic parasite. The best example of a periodic parasite is the female mosquito, which sucks blood from the vertebrate host. The host blood is required for egg development. Without a blood meal, the female mosquito will not have sufficient protein to lay her eggs. Another is the hyperparasite. A hyperparasite is a parasite within a mosquito. An example of this is malaria in mosquitoes. So malaria is caused by the protozoa of the genus Plasmodium. So we have here the plas uh, Plasmodium that's, that is present in the RBC. So the Plasmodium is considered to be a parasite and mosquito is considered to be also a parasite. So the mosquito harbors the plasmodium and for example when the 
uh, the mosquito no, will bite to a specific host so it can cause malaria in that particular host. So another important terminology is the, are the pseudoparasites. So living creatures or objects that are not parasitic may be mistaken for or erroneously identified as parasites. So these are referred to as pseudoparasites. Sometimes fecal flotation procedures will reveal pollen grains from trees such as pine pollen or from flowering plants. A novice veterinary student or veterinary technician may view these pollen grains on fecal flotation and erroneously identify them as parasites. So we have here an example of a pseudoparasite, not the tree pollen, and we have also have here the pine pollen. They are not parasites, but they can be mistaken for parasites uh, during under the microscope during fecal flotation techniques. For other examples, we have here uh, on the left we have the yeast, yeast in an iodine stain concentrated wet mount of stool. Yeast in wet mounts may be confused for Giardia. So Giardia is an example of a protozoan parasite. We also have here um, on the right we have the pollen grain in a concentrated wet mount of stool. So this grain looks very similar to the fertile egg of Ascaris lumbricoides. Ascaris uh, lumbricoides refers to the large round worm of man. We also have here other examples of the pseudoparasitic particles that was recovered in a wastewater plant in a study in Iran. So from this portion here up to this one, this represents uh, some examples of pseudoparasitic particles that were identified as pollen grains from different plant species. And this can be uh, mistaken for the X of the parasite. We also have here you know, from a letter I, K, L, and M. This, uh, these are Ascaris egg-like particles in raw domestic wastewater. So these uh, particles you now can be mistaken for the eggs of Ascaris lumbricoides, which is the a large round worm of humans. The letter J here represents the the what no what Ascaris lumbricoides egg should look like. 